Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, and welcome to the Wasiliana Hub Masterclass. My name is Emerald Midega, and I'm your session host for today. Um, this is a, a Wasiliana Hub Masterclass that is uh, the Conflict Transpo uh, Transformation and uh, the CLEE series, which is uh, continuous learning for the year 2021. And today being Thursday, 15th of April, 2021, we'll be having a session on addiction uh, with our med moderator, mediator Catherine Waroe as our facilitator for the day. So to enable us to uh, kickstart the session, let us begin with the national anthem, the first stanza in Kiswahili. I will lead you through it, uh, but I will also share the screen and you can come along with me. <clears throat> e mungu nguvu yetu ilete baraka kwetu haki iwe ngao na mlinzi na tukae na undugu amani na uhuru raha tupate na ustawi Okay, uh, uh, welcome again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as mentioned earlier, we'll be having uh, mediator Catherine Waroe taking us through addiction and uh, substance abuse, as well as how it relates to mediation. Uh, mediator Catherine, how are you? Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. How are you? I'm, I'm good. How has it been? I'm good. Uh, okay, Karibu Sana, we are very excited and elated to have you here and excited to hear what you have for us. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to mention just a few rules that can help us uh, to help us with the masterclass uh, <clears throat> to facilitate us. Uh, so first of all, as a facilitator, we'll be proceeding with the session, uh, which is the first part. Kindly take notes on your end and then uh, if for any pressing comments, kindly insert them in the comment section that has been um, enabled. And then we will revert back to them during the Q&A session. And then um, if there's any sort of interruption, because this is technology, uh, if there's any sort of uh, interruption, kindly relax. Uh, you, may, you may be logged out, but uh, kindly re-log in, and then uh, we can proceed with that. And uh, then just basically take this opportunity, this great opportunity to learn uh, from what, what we are going to get from Mediator Catherine. <clears throat> um, yes, Mediator Catherine, Karibu Sana. Uh, the, floor is, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, I'm happy to be here this afternoon, trying to share uh, what I have about uh, addiction and dependence. It is a big issue in this country, not even Kenya alone, but in the whole world. And more so at this particular time that we are faced with the lockdown because of COVID-19. We are seeing most of our population getting addicted, entering into substance abuse. And it also happens that we can land in our, on our table as mediators, because some of those cases maybe they, they might need uh, mediation, they might have disputes because they are not uh, free of disputes. So they might have disputes and then we find ourselves having them on our table, being referred, or maybe they come to us as mediators so that we can be able to mediate them. So uh, I just want to invite you today so that we can, we can, I can share what we have, what I have. It is such a big, uh, wide topic, such a wide, uh, you know, um, topic of, uh, of, of addiction that it cannot be done within an hour or two, but I have really compressed what I have so that we can be able to discuss what I have and maybe, uh, you know, get something out of it and be able to, you know, to mediate in case such, such a scenario comes to us. So you are most welcomed. Thank you. Okay, um, we can proceed uh, to your presentation.
Okay. Karibu sana, the floor is yours. You can see? No. Go to the next. Thank you. Uh, for us to, to be able to understand what the scenario, what is happening, it is important that we talk about uh, some of the, the keywords that I believe they are very important that are going to be mentioned often in this, uh, in this presentation so that we can know what they are, they are all about. The first one is addiction and chemical dependence. What do I, what do I, what, what do you understand by the word addiction and chemical, chemical dependence? Actually, science says that this is a disease caused by a wrong habitual use of drugs and other substances of abuse. You know, in, a, in, in, in fact, addiction is a brain disease. It is important that uh, even in the medical field, they usually term it as a disease model. A disease model means what? It is a disease that actually affects the brain. So it is important that we understand yeah, addiction is a, uh, is a disease that is caused by habitual use. Habitual mean, use means often recurrent use of drugs. And they also say that addiction, it, this is a progressive illness which is incurable, but it can be controlled, yeah? So it is incurable. However, we can control it. And then it is characterized by a pattern of repeated self-administration of the drug of choice, resulting in tolerance, withdrawal and compulsive uh, drug taking. What do we mean by this? Yeah. When you see an addict, actually, it is actually, you know, um, that is the characteristics of, uh, of dependence. And then there's the, the word we call tolerance. This word you are going to meet it often as we continue. And which is increased amount of drug required to achieve the same effect. That is what we call tolerance. If I was taking one bottle of beer, as I continue, I'll take two, I'll take three, I'll take four, I'll take five, so that it can make me feel high that the way, the way I would like to feel. Dependence. This is a psychological and physical state caused by interaction of drugs. And, and, and for a person, so that is what we call dependence. Somebody cannot function unless they use this drug. And it's also characterized by compassion to take the drug despite the negative. There are so many negative effects. However, that com compassion that somebody needs to take the drug out, you know, outweighs the, the benefit of not taking the drug. So it is important that we understand these, these terms, like tolerance, so that when we hear them as we continue, we understand what, what we mean. Thank you. Detoxification. Uh, this is the first step in addiction treatment. Yeah, this is uh, this are a word that we need to understand where medication is given. That is before somebody goes for treatment or goes for in for any rehabilitation, they need to be de uh, done detoxification. That is, they need to get clear of the drug that is in the system. That is all what we call detox, detoxification. That is removing the substance, the substance from the body system and reduce the discomfort. Most of these clients, when they come to us as addiction professionals, they are usually in withdrawals. They are usually in a lot of pain. So what do we do? We usually, they are usually given some medication so that you can reduce the discomfort that they are going through because of the symptoms that they, you know, they are experiencing. Thank you. Now, a very important question. Why do people use drugs? Why do people use alcohol? Yeah, just, just go back. Just go back a bit. Yeah, why do people use drugs? Why do people use alcohol? You know, uh, when you see an alcoholic, actually, who is so drunk, falling on the, on the trenches, you know, we tend to ask ourselves, who, 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 who told him to go and take the, the, the alcohol? Who told him to go and take the drug? Why do, they have, why do you have to work so hard for that day? And the, at the end of the month, what, whatever you do is just to go and drink, drink yourself, you know, uh, to stupor. So why do people use drugs? It is important to say, to know that, um, I said that addiction is a, is a disease, it's a brain disease. And it is also important to learn that addiction is a disease, actually it is a disease process. 
and actually it is a neuro, 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 neurobiology of the neurobiology of addiction. It's important that we learn about it. Eh? This is a disease that affects every disease that we can call a disease affects an organ. It affects an organ of the body. And when it affects the organ of the body, there is a cause, there is a defect in that organ that has been affected by uh, that disease. And what does the defect uh, do to somebody? It produces symptoms, yeah? So we can say that, uh, you know, addiction is a disease that affects an organ. And when we talk of an organ, which one is that? It's the brain. And when the brain is affected, there is the defect. The defect is what happens to the brain when it is affected by the substance that we are using. And when it is affected, what happens? It produces, we usually see symptoms. And the symptoms are the ones that, uh, you know, uh, tell us that this somebody is in addiction, this somebody is sick in whichever uh, context of sickness. So why do people use drugs? Let's continue. People use drugs because they have something that they are craving to. One, because of the effects of drugs or substance of drug cause that it causes in the mind. They, we call it a reward system. Somewhat get rewarded, the brain gets rewarded from the drug that we are using. Yeah, from using the And this drug, it produces pressure. Somebody feels good about it. There is a relief because somebody was anxious. You know, and I said, I want to take one. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm in the shags. Eh? That's why you can hear my cochlear uh, making noise. Eh? So somebody, you go to, uh, to take a, a bottle or uh, go to take a, a sip of, uh, or maybe cocaine or heroin so that they can relieve the anxiety or a sense of inadequacy. Somebody feels that I'm not able to function. And that is why I really want to take this drug so that, you know, Majority of them say that when they take in the morning, they usually say that before then he's not able to function, but after taking the drug, that somebody is able to function and do whatever he's supposed to do. But that is not, uh, you know, the end of everything. That cannot, when it is used long term, it has got its own effects. And then people also use drugs because lack of purpose of living. Yeah. Somebody has lost purpose. I don't need, I, I, you know, I have no value for my, for my living. I don't see why I should be alive. I don't see why I should do what I'm doing. So those are shifting shadows because, you know, he's taking the drug or she's taking the drug and saying that, you know, they don't have the purpose of living. They, they are shifting the problem because the problem is not the drug. The problem is not them. It's only that they have not gone inside to deal with the problems that they, they go through. Some of them say that they, they lack love. I'm taking the drug because you hear the, the answer saying that, you know, I'm behaving the way I'm behaving because I don't, you know, people want to have a People do not understand. People do not love me. And that is why I'm taking the drug. That is why I'm drinking. Actually, we can attest for the people who, for the, for the people, for us who have, you know, the youngsters and the, the teenagers and maybe the young adults, that is what they say. They want, you know, they, they, they say that I am taking this because there's nobody who cares me about this family. In this family, there's nobody, even my parents are not really taking care of, they do not even love me, they do not even care what happens to me. And then they also say that there's need to belong. They take because I want to be with my peers. I want to be with, you know, like my workmates. I want to be like the people of my class. So they want to have that sense of belonging. And that is why they take drugs. To be part of the social group, that is in the campus, the guys, for the people who have gone through campus, for the people who have gone through, yeah, you know, uh, colleges and even schools, they take it because they want to identify themselves with that group and they feel that they are part of it. That is work, and even in the place, work, in the workplace, work buddies. This is what our, my workmates are doing. Why should I be left behind? So that is why they, that is another reason as why people take drugs. Thank you. They also take drugs because they want to escape, ex escape sin. You know, they want to ex ex escape from maybe disappointment. Maybe it is a relationship. 
somebody who was in an abusive relationship or somebody got dumped. They want to escape from that disappointment. Somebody failed. I am doing this because I lost. I am a failure. So you get somebody entering into drugs because they, they want to forget what they have gone through. And we call it drowning your misery. They say that they are drowning their misery. They are, you know, they want to, you know, to do away with the grief, uh, you know, because they, maybe they are grieving and how do they, how do they want to, you know, uh, to forget the grief by, you know, drowning them, themselves in whatever substance that they take. Others say that they are doing it for experimentation. Curiosity, the teenage, they start alcohol, they start drugs, they start banging, they start smoking. Why? Because they want to experiment. I have seen when people take alcohol, you know, they start laughing. They, start, they, are, they seem happy, yeah? And so why don't I also try it so that I can experience what they're experiencing? So that is curiosity. You want to go in and, 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 and understand and feel what these people are feeling. And then they also, we also say that some of them lack spirituality, spirituality because in, uh, in our own spiritual journey, there are some things that you, you know, you are told, you, you are told they are not good, you are told they are not good, you are not supposed to do it. So if you are not having that, you know, higher power that we talk about, you get somebody just engaging in some of those, uh, you know, behaviors just because they lack that. Others are due to ignorance. They do it because they, 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 they don't know, they don't know. People, you know, take, you know, take, take, take um, to smoking. They do not even understand what that smoking will do to their body. They do not understand what that alcohol consumption will do to their, you know, internal organs. So it is ignorance. Some of them do it because of ignorance. And then there's also the genetic predisposition. What do I mean by this? Yeah. Uh, why do people take drugs? Yeah, that is actually part. That is, there are so many things that um, there are so many uh, issues that makes people take drugs. However, it's also important that we understand the theories, the theories behind addiction and dependence. They are there, and one some of the theories is about neuro, neurobiological theories. This explains actually the neurobiological theories explains the effects of drugs. Uh, drug drug dependence in the, in the biological terms. That is how it affects us in the in the brain. How it affects affects us in our body. You know, so those studies are there that uh, we can uh, we can learn about them. The theories about why biology neurobiologically how why somebody uh, get themselves addicted to drugs. Uh, the second one is about uh, the second approach is on psychological or. Theories is on the psychological, yeah, on the psychological explanation, concentrating on the behavioral models. Yeah, actually, people take drugs, and it affects their, the the psychological aspect. So there are psychological uh, theories that we can read and learn about them, so that we can know why those the behavioral models, uh, why individuals uh, take to drugs, and, and also. We, we are able to, to, to also run the cognitive uh, models of theories that make somebody end up in being addicted. Uh, the third one is about um, approaches on the sociocultural aspect. Yeah. This one explains about, you know, why people take drugs. It's, it might be due to culture, it might be due to environmental factors that make the drug dependence more likely, where somebody is growing up. So it is important. So curiosity. As I said earlier, it is one of the things that make somebody, you would like the youth, anybody who has not taken this drug would like to know, you know, how are these people feeling? I want to know, I want to experience what these guys are experiencing. I also want to take it because I want to fit in. All my peers are doing it. Why am I not doing it? And why shouldn't I do it? And if you don't do it, there is also bullying. They want you to, to fit in. There's also the peer pressure in schools, in our environment. Right now, what is happening as our kids are at home? What is happening as our, we are locked down, we are locked, we are locked down, we cannot go out. People get so frustrated, yeah? So the peer pressure in schools, in campus, you know, that sense of, you know, of belonging is, it makes people go to, 
drugs, the pressure, the pressure, you feel there's a lot of pressure and you really want to, you know, whatever you, is, you are going through is really driving you crazy. And what do you do? I'll go to the bar and take one for the road so that I can forget what is happening to me. They also want to relieve stress. People drink to relieve stress. People take drugs to relieve stress. They think that they are taking it to relieve stress. But unfortunately, it's not relieving stress. You just, you know, masking the stress that you are going through. But immediately the drug we are, we are, lost, we are off. What happens? The, 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 the stressor, you still be there because you have not dealt with the stressor. And that is what people should understand. Our community should understand, understand. Our youth should understand that as much as I will take alcohol so that I can forget, I'll just forget that. But when I wake up tomorrow morning, the stressor is still there. I have not dealt with the stress. So you have to know how to deal with the stress instead of you know drowning yourself into addiction or into drugs, rebellion. Wow. This is key. And maybe even us, when you are growing up, we did some of those things so that we can rebel against, uh, you know, against the, the, the administration. We rebel against the, the, the family, the, the parents. We rebel. So they do it for so that they can, for them to be rebellious. Thank you. In other words, a major reason people take drugs is they like what it does to their brain. As I said earlier, it is a brain disease. And as, as I pointed out, yeah, that the organ that is affected by drugs or substance is the brain. So whatever happens in the brain, that feeling, because when you start the drug, there's that feeling of high, there's that feeling of goodness because of what the drug produces in the brain. They produces a chemical, a neurotransmitter called dopamine, which makes us feel happy, feel at the, at the, you know, at the top of the world. Feel that, yeah, this is, you know, I usually call it like a, when somebody takes the first drug or the first time somebody takes drugs, I usually call it like having the first of us. It is usually pressure up. And it is something that somebody will not have it, even if you try it so many times. And that is where tolerance comes in. That is where dependence comes in. Because you really want to feel that orgasm that you felt the first time you took the drug. Yeah, the dopamine, what the dopamine produced when you took that drug, it is something that you never feel any other time in your life. So if you are not careful, you just drain yourself, go in and drown yourself, trying to feel that high that you felt the first time. So in other words, a major reason people take drugs is they like what it does to them. They like that feeling of high. They like that feeling of, you know, that tea that you never feel it again in your life. Thank you. Wow, as I said, when, an organ, when a disease affects an organ, there is the defect to that, to that organ. And then after the defect, there are the symptoms that come in. And that is when somebody starts feeling, wow, I'm not okay. Wow, I'm having fever. Wow, I'm coughing. Wow. Yeah, you know, those are the symptoms. And even somebody seeing you, you say, oh, you look so weak. You look like you are sick. Those are the, the symptoms. And then, so there are signs and symptoms of somebody who is uh, in arms. One. The first sign that we should look for, even in our families, that as we are locked down in Nairobi and in the environment, they is that. These drugs are very expensive, as I can attest, anybody else can attest, they are very expensive. So for somebody to maintain that drug, because when you take it, as I say, they store it. You have to continue taking it and take it and take it until, you know, you never, you, 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 you never have it any, you never, have that high that you felt the first time. So what happened? You start, you know, people start stealing, theft in the family, theft in the community, theft, theft in schools, theft in everywhere that people are. Those are unexplained loss of items. And, you know, unexplained loss of items. You know, you, 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 something is lost and nobody can explain where it is because he, the, the person who took it will not, not even explain where it is. Discipline problems in schools. That is why we are having so many. Uh, in discipline cases in schools, burning of schools, loyalty everywhere, even the place of work. 
you get people, you know, you, you know, you get people doing what? People going and having go through, people, you know, rioting, people saying no, there's no work, we can't work. And if, if it is in school, inattentiveness. You find even at home, you tell your child to do something, maybe at a he has, she or he has forgotten. They are very inattentive to what you are talking about, declining performance in work output, even in school. Yeah. You start seeing your child, the grade is dropping. And that is the time you should start asking yourself, why is the grade dropping? And if it is a, a child who is a school going, they start becoming, you know, unkept. Yeah. Somebody who was so kept, somebody who was so neat, they start, you start noticing there's a, you know, this child, this person is becoming unkept. What is not happening? This person is not becoming attentive. You, you know, this person is not, you know, pouring what he, he was pouring. You, you look at them for people who use maybe marijuana, you, you get, you know, red short eyes. So there's so much, yeah. And then the public service expectation and complaints rise in absurdism. Somebody is not going to work. If it is school, somebody is not going to school. And then we continue. There are so many sick ofs and disappearances and fake their sicknesses, tiredness, and cringe of sicknesses. Somebody, you know, you are not able to work. So what happens? They go to the hospital and come with a with a sick with, with a sick sheet. Symptoms and uh, you know there are accidents on the job, dramatic decline in job performance, personal habits. You know, you, you know you start noticing that this person is not the, the habits of you know. If somebody was a, a footballer or somebody was very interested in uh, extracurricular, it just fits off. Drunk, this lack of concentration, poor hygiene, as I said, and appearance. You look at this somebody who has if it's your child, if it's your uh, your colleague, uh, things are not working and preoccupation with it. You know, they are all preoccupied with drinking or looking for a drug. Always, you know, their preoccupation is where will I get the next fix? Where will I get the next drug? I would like to schedule a meeting, a seminar on my current as soon as I can find time to buy a current. You can imagine, can you see behind what that person is having behind his, uh, you know, his table? You know, disorganization. Why is this person disorganized? must maybe must be using drugs. They are not even bothered of what is happening. Yes. Wow. These drugs, how do, we, how do we get to put them in our body? Because as I said, they have to, they are, no one has got to be, you know, to, to be affected. Some of them are taken orally, orally is by mouth. Some of them, we, they, they inject uh, some drug. Some of them, we smoke. All of them, we sniff, inhale. Some of them are patches. They are just used as patches on, their, on, 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 on our bodies. Some of them are inserted by rectum, yeah? Some of those drugs. Others are inserted by the front, the vagina. And then some of them are wrapped. So there are so many ways of uh, drug administration that people use, yeah? Depending on the type of drug. Uh, these are just, uh, you know, pictorial of how drugs are used, as you can see. I think it is what I have said, so we can go to the next one. There's smoking, there's chewing, there are drugs that you swallow, there's injecting. Yeah. So how do these people manifest when somebody is in, uh, in, in, in substance abuse? Yeah. As I said earlier, there's also there's, uh, a lot of physical deterioration from persistent use. Yeah, you can notice somebody who is on drugs, they can develop a skin rash. There's also the liver damage when somebody goes to the hospital and done maybe a scan, there's liver damage. There's cognitive damage. Cognitive is about the mind, the psyche. There's damage. This somebody is not able to, you know, to think, is not able to comprehend, is not able even to, to make, uh, you know, uh, to, to, make, to, to make ends or what he's supposed to talk about. Strong subjective drive to use substance. That that urge that somebody really wants to use the drugs. No, often you can you know that it is all that is you know preoccupying this person. Yeah, in large amounts of for longer periods. That is tolerance, as I said about persistent desire to cut down on amounts of use. They didn't want to cut. Okay, muskiya leo anasema mimi kesho sita kunywa na hii dio ya mwicho. 
in fact, and you know, somebody takes this, this bottle and says, this is my last bottle. But that is persistent. They didn't want to cut down, but they are not able. Because as I say, it is a brain disease. And this brain disease, it cannot just wish be wished away. Yeah? They're involved in virtual all of the person's daily activities around, you know, all what they, 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 they are, they, you know, they are preoccupied the whole day, every now and then, on where to get the next, the next fix, on where to get the, sense, the, the next drug. This sense of guilt, for someone who has taken drugs for long, they would like to stop. Actually, it's not that they didn't like it. It's not that they didn't want it. It's not that they are really dying to, to have it. But they are not able to control it because it has really affected the brain. It has taken over and it, so that somebody has become addicted. So there is that sense of guilt. They know they are doing wrong. They know that this is not what they are supposed to be doing. But unfortunately, they cannot, they, they cannot stop it. Irritability or annoyance of a family or friends express concern about you. Actually, they didn't get irritated. They didn't get worked up. They didn't get, you know, they feel like they are being abused when they are, somebody tells them, you are, you, in these days you are, you are drinking too much. That, that whatever you are doing is not right. And because they, they didn't want to stop it, but they can't. So they didn't get in detail. Yeah. This just manifestation continued. The manifestation is just signed. There's waste of great, uh, great time, deal of time seeking the drug. Yeah. The substance are recovering from their effects. Somebody took too much last night. In the morning, what happened? You know, they are not, you know, and somebody says, I feel like my head is bursting. I feel like, you know, I'm not even able to, I'm not even able to see, I'm not even able to wake up. My head is just, you know, throbbing. So great time of, a great waste of time with the draws from healthy hobbies. This person, maybe they were, they were footballers. They don't play anymore. The hobbies, they have shared the hobbies. They cannot function. They cannot, you know, they, ca they cannot now do what they used to do. Yeah. Friends and family in order to use the drugs. So they will draw. They withdraw from home base, they withdraw from families. Actually, they run away from home. They withdraw from, you know, friends, the friends that usually are yeah, always telling them that now squeeze me, Nakuni Masana. These days you are drinking too much. Whatever you are drinking is, you know, it is driving you away. So actually, they withdraw. Raising money through dubious means, they would like to, you know, uh, to steal. They do all sorts of crime for them to get the money because they want to get the next way to. To get the next fix, they have to, they cannot function without the next fix. Characteristics of an addict. Yeah. Wow. How is the characteristic of somebody who is addicted? One, obsession. They are obsessed. There is nothing else that matters in their life. They are always thinking about the positive effects of the using drugs, the high rate that they feel, that high that they feel when they take drugs, actively planning and looking forward to seeing them. Now and again, that is the obsession. Nothing else matters in their life. All what matters is the next dose, where I get the money, and how I feel when I get that drug. That is obsession. The other one is compassion. They are compassive. This is irrational urge of craving. They feel that I crave. They feel that you know I have to take this drug. That is you know that urge. You feel that you really want to take. They have to take the drug. That is compassion. They are compassed. That is compassion. You always, they, you didn't want to go and take that drug. Nothing else matters in, 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 your, in your surrounding apart from the drug. Even if it means that you risking your life, they are ready to do that. Emotional logic works to satisfy them. Agency and compassion to use the drug. That is the emotional logic. The emotional logic is, you know, the agency. I just want, that is the logic that they, they, they have, just to where to get the next fix, where to get the money, and types of dependence. As I said, they are depend, they depend, their types of addiction has got types. One is physical dependence. What do I mean by physical dependence? It's important to know that it's a state of physical adjustment with increasing levels of tolerance. As I say, tolerance is taking larger amounts of what you are taking so that you can feel you can you can feel that high that you felt the first time that you took the drug and as i said it is unfortunately you never feel it somebody will never feel it so you need needing large amounts of the drug to get the same effects 
coupled with withdrawal symptoms. The withdrawals is what drives an addict or a dependent person crazy. It is painful. It is very uncomfortable, depending on the type of drug. It is, it is euphoric. It is something that somebody you not even, you will not like to start because it is very painful. For instance, things like heroin, there's a lot of abdominal pains, there's a lot of body aches, there's a lot of headaches. And for alcohol, there's that feeling that, you know, you cannot function, you are not normal. And so, you know, those withdrawals are, are the ones that make somebody feel, I have to continue taking the drug physical dependence, behavioral dependence. The person feels incompetent or unable to function appropriately without a drug. You're worried maybe where we have worked or maybe you have relatives who use drugs. The first thing that they do is they have to for the drug. And what do they say? One a lot. Because they feel they cannot be able to function without uh, you know, taking one to come. They usually say, it is coming my nerves. I have to take this for, the, for me to come my nerves, for me to be able to function. For somebody to be able to lift this this pen and not uh, you know make it fall, otherwise somebody will just be shaking and trembling so much. Uh, there's also social dependence. This is marked by a related lifestyle. The abuser adjusts his life to ensure access to drugs. Social dependence. You have to be that somebody look for people who are their his peers in whatever drug they're taking. The individual cannot function socially without the drugs. So for somebody to take, uh, to be able to function normally or not even normally, socially, they have to take the drug. And the relationship stays to allow and support use and provide protection from consequences of drugs. So you have, they identify themselves with the people they use the drugs with. If it is an alcoholic, you have to identify yourself with other alcoholics because those are the people who will understand you. Those are the people who will, you know, when he don't, does not have the, the, the money, they will be able to give him, you know, or maybe even be, be able to buy them. Have you ever had what that wife? Yeah, uh, an alcoholic will never give another alcoholic money, but will always give a, uh, the alcohol. Um, somebody who smokes, you see them sharing that even if it is as small as what, that can stay. They can share so many people sharing that one stay. So that is, that is social dependence. They depend on their, uh, you know, on their colleagues or the people they use the drugs with for their survival. Uh, as I say, there's also the addiction process. It does not happen overnight. And this one, I think it is just a repetition of what, what, what we started. It does not happen overnight. As I said, they start with the experiment. I want to experiment. Why do people take drugs? Even in our families, you know, you know, right now people have moved the bars from the bar, the, the drinking joints from the bars to their homes. Why? Because there's curfew and uh, and there's there's curfew, there's curfew, and uh, they feel that now I cannot, you know, for me to be able to drink because I have to continue with my drinking. Uh, they they have taken them to the to to, to back to their homes. Unfortunately, sorry for that. However, as our kids are seeing us drinking and they see us laughing because when you start alcohol consumption, people feel high, they feel happy about it. So there's a lot of laughter, there's a lot of talking, you know, people enjoy what they are doing at the, to start with, but with the time, you know, the depression sets in. However, for, an, for a youth or for a teenage, they would like to know why dad and mom are so happy when they drink, why my uncles are so happy when they drink. When they pass through somewhere, there is a there is a bar. They see people laughing, people shouting, people dancing. They also want to experiment. So they want to experiment. The second one is about the social use. They want to socialize. They want to belong. They want to have a sense of belonging. Instrumental, habitual, and compulsive. I think they are going to be you know expounded as we continue. In the experimental stage, what is the motive? As I said, the curiosity. They also, also want to risk, they, you know, uh, they want this risky taking. They peer pressure. They want to do adventure, thrill of adventure. And as I said earlier there, this is the rebellion. The second stage is social use. Why social stage? 
the primary motivation of this is just to social acceptance. I want to be accepted by peers. Yeah, the individual remains functional. They feel that when I'm when I when I've taken what I usually take, I I remain functional. I'm able to function. I'm able to continue. Come on, the mathematician. You see, I got one person who was a a statistician, and he was very good in what he does. But he had to use alcohol for him to continue uh, functioning the way he's supposed to function. There is also the level of use really identified as risk by adolescents and young adults. That is the social stage. And then the warning and cautions are ignored, and no one believes that negative consequences will ever happen to them. Nobody during the social stage can have, can believe anything negative can, can happen to them. The instrumental stage. Individuals learn to use substances purposely to manipulate emotions and behavior. I want to feel happy. They want to manipulate their own decision, their own emotions and behavior. Uh, when I was young, I used to hear people, guys say that I'll drink so that I can, I can be able to approach that girl, confront that girl. In families, you hear a man saying that I'm going to drink so that I am going to, now my wife is going to meet me. Um, she's going to know who I am. The individuals discover that alcohol and other drugs can affect feelings and, 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 and actions. So why, why, why do we want to take it? Because we want to suppress a feeling. Maybe they are, you know, PTSD. Maybe they are stressive events. You want to drink so that you can suppress that. Others feel that when I drink, it enhances. I'm able to cope. I'm able to, to talk with my peers. I'm able to bring out what I'm supposed to bring. It also disinhibits behavior. Some of them take it so that their behavior can be disinhibited. We inhibit the behavior. Maybe somebody acts, you know, abnormally when they are, you know, when they are the, no, 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 no influence, and somebody would like to inhibit that. Thank you, or disinhibit that. Right? I'm shy. I'm shy, and so if I'm shy, why don't I take one so that I can be able to, uh, to talk? Habitual stage. These symptoms of dependence starts to appear. This is habitual is when you take it often. Now it's not even about the, the, the experiment, it's not about the social. You want to socialize with your peers. They say that on Friday, that is the you know, member's day, that is where let me go and socialize. Uh, but now this is habitual. Habitual means that now it has become a habit. Yeah, you've you've taken you you moved it from. You graduated from experiment, you went to social, and now here you are. It is now habitual. You cannot function. Symptoms of dependence starts to appear. The abuser's lifestyle becomes progressively centered around using the drugs as a means of coping and recreating. They are not able to create without the drug. The individuals use the, uh, the substance to leave their discomfort of non use. Yeah, because of the withdrawals, as I said, the withdrawals are. They are very, 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 you know, uh, uncomfortable. So somebody would like to continue. The individual starts to use their, uh, starts to sense the impending dependence. They start feeling now, I cannot function without this thing. So that is why we call the, the habitual stage. So they react to it by establishing various self-imposed rules and limits. But they say that, ah, nita kunywa leo, kesho sita kunywa, kesho kutwa, like that. But unfortunately now it becomes habitual. They begin to break the rules. The rules are there, but they start to break the rules because of their drinking. Drugs becomes medicine for problems. That is where the habitual stage takes somebody. The drug becomes a medicine for the problem. If I don't want to feel shy, I have to. If I don't want to, you know, uh, people to think that I'm, I'm not capable, they have to drink. Thank you. Then there's the compulsive stage. Compulsive means what? The, the urge, the urge is too much. You, the, that you are really urged, the, the compassion, you are really forced, pushed to the wall. The individual is now preoccupied with the drug use to the extent that getting high or planning for it is all that he thinks about and does. Nothing else matters in their life. All what matters is me getting the next bit. The only relationship the addict has is with his or her drug. You know, they, actually their relationship just goes off. Not with the family, not with the workmate, not with the peer, nothing else matters. But they now have that relationship with the drug of choice. That is now what matters in their life. This is my, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine. Compulsive use is totally out of control and chemicals are now running the individual's life. They cannot, it has taken over their life. 
drug has taken it is it has hijacked in 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 the in, in the best better word it has hijacked their life thank you so what do, what am i talking about this that downward spiral of psychological addiction we said they start with the curiosity they want they were curious they wanted to know then they went to implementation they want to experiment what this drug does and then as they do it they, you know, it, it makes somebody feel that euphoric, uh, euphoric uh, feeling, high, high. But with the time, they feel that the high goes down. Yeah, you know, this, this, um, this behavior is going down. So as and because it's going down, they continue taking more, and that is where we come to tolerance. Tolerance sets in because whatever I took uh, when I was curious is not what I took when I when I became, uh, you know, experimentation. I took another drug. And then for me to feel that, I went on and on until I became tolerant. So in tolerance, what happened? There is elevated use of drugs. If I was taking five beers, the next time you fight me, I'll have, uh, you know, they have stepped on the crate of beer, yeah? So there is elevated use. And then as they uh, elevated use, there is less euphoria. They do not, actually, there is also de depression that sets in with, with, uh, with that, uh, with that continued use of the drugs. And then there's the great dysphoria, that feeling of, you know, uh, that feeling of not happy, feeling of not, you know, not being himself or herself. So what happens? They get withdrawals, yeah? Withdrawals means what? You know, that feel, the body was accustomed to a drug. Now the drug has been, you know, it's not enough. So the body is really fighting because the withdrawals are there. Somebody would like the drug, but the organ, the, you know, it is not there. So what happens? They start, you know, feeling uh, like now if it's alcohol, they feel, you know, we, we call it, uh, they start, you know, tremors, they start trembling. If it is um, a heroin, they, they have the headache, they have the, the, the stomach, you know, the abdominal pains, which are really tough. And then what happens? Because they are really feeling for these withdrawals because they are really painful. They elevated the use of drugs, elevated drug use. And then when they elevated the drug use, they get a relief, they withdraw. So, you know, if somebody was troubling because they have not had a fungu aloki, what happens? It comes the nurse. So they get they, they get the relief the withdrawals. Uh, from there, they, they, if they do not continue with the drug, the withdrawals uh, sets in. And then what happens? They elevate the, again the, the, the drug use. So uh, that is why we call it, it. It's a spiral. It's a downward spiral, and that happens in the in the addiction or in the dependence, uh, as independence life. There's a drug uh, addiction equation. What do I say? The reasons why abusing drugs plus drugs. What happens? That is, you get somebody gets immediate pressure. That is immediate, that feeling of high. Yeah. And then this the feeling of high, what happens plus long term pain? Because as you take drugs, you get the immediate uh, pressure. That is the, what you have been looking for. And then you, it is coupled because the long term thing is long term pain. Because for you to come out of the, of, of, of the dependence, for you to come out of the substance that you have been using, it is long term. And it is painful. It, it takes time. So this long term, what does it do? It leads to leading to drug use, and the equation continues, as we have seen in the pictorial up there. The, 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 the cycle continues, yeah? unless the chain is broken, and that is where we are going to go. Unless the chain is broken, and how will the chain be broken? by seeking treatment and rehabilitation. Seeking treatment and rehabilitation. Up not, excuse me, and up again. Excuse me, just the, the, the previous slide. Yeah, treatment and rehabilitation, yes. So what do we do? Treatment is the provision of one or more structured intervention designed to manage health and others. Uh, problem is starting from uh, drug use and substance to improve of maximum personal functioning and social integrity. The people have got to be integrated after they have been uh, 
you know, after they have been treated. Next. Treatment is actually part of rehabilitation, and this includes counseling, skills training, and drug therapy. Yeah, that is when it involves. Yeah, we, it can involve drugs. It can involve. Yeah, the uh, the previous one. Yeah, it can involve uh, being given drugs, it can involve detoxification treatment or incidental psychological or psychiatric problems, e.g. depression for treatment. Thank you. Next one. Uh, there's also rehabilitation. Rehabilitation, this is a process for identification of substance abuse through treatment and for up to the time the abuser is reintegrated in the society. As I said, uh, addiction is a disease. And I said it is a disease model. Uh, even it is a mental, it is a, a brain disease that needs uh, treatment. Not all of us really appreciate uh, addiction or dependence as a disease. We always uh, point out, point figures to the abusers and say that they are the ones who started it. Yeah. So we do not, majority of us, even the community does not understand that these people they are really sick and they really need to be treated. Social integration, the progress, the process of getting a drug abuser back into mainstream society, that is social reintegration after treating, after making this person, you know, making this person understand that they are in problems and after removing them from this problem, what happens? You are supposed to reintegrate them. Because most of the most of the times when we take these people back to the community, they have even baptized them. This person has worked very hard to be reintegrated in the society. This person has worked very hard to go back to the family. However, what do the family do? They usually view him as, as, as an alcoholic. And now what to now it our levy. And what happens? It is very hurting and very disheartening, uh, you know, to this person who is really working very hard. Because as I said, it is a disease. It is a disease that somebody cannot bring himself or herself out unless so much is done for this person to work. However, they say that it's the willpower for this person. But when somebody tries to, to work on their addiction after, you know, being re rehabilitated, the families and the for society which which is the back if somebody something is stolen in the family who will be the first person to be to, to be thought that has taken it it must have been the addict it has been it has must be the attacker because they feel this is the only person who can who, who can steal and i tell you for a fact it hurts them when they come sharing to us they say that it hurts me it hurts me to see that my parents my family does not you know, no, the pain I'm going through for, for, for me to be to be sober. They still call me Uteja. They still feel that I'm one who has, who has taken whatever is, he has been lost in the house. It entails working with families and communities to help re-establishment of substance abusers. That is rehabilitation. The families has got to come, to come into, into the picture. The community has got to be brought into the picture so that they can understand. But this person, even if they were addicted, they are working very hard to leave the behavior. They are working very hard to be reintegrated, to be somebody in the society. The goals of treatment and rehabilitation. What are the goals of treatment? The goal is to maintain physiological and emotional improvement initiated during the detoxification and stabilization. That is the goal. We want this person to be who he was before. We want to, to remove this addicted person inside this person and bring this person, the person who was before he got into substance abuse. Those are the goals of treatment and, re and rehabilitation. We work very hard for this person to even appreciate himself, appreciate who he is before. Uh, before he got addicted, and now who he was, he is after he has been, you know, 
reintegrated and he has been treated to support the behavior that lead to improved social personal health. We are, that is the goal of treatment and rehabilitation. We want to support our behavior because we say the behavioral aspect, yeah, the behavioral aspect, that is what maybe uh, might bring, take him back to where he, he was or him, how, whatever she was. So we want to support, you know, behavior, desired behavior in the community for this person to come back to the community and start behaving, you know, uh, the way he was behaving before he went, he, he got addicted. And then the social function, we want him to, to function socially, not necessarily using the drugs. And we also want to reduce the threat to public health and safety. And when somebody is addicted, he's a, he's a threat to the public health. He's a threat for safety of himself and even for the community around. And we also want to motivate, yeah, we want to motivate behavior and lifestyle changes that are incompatible with the substance abuse. We want to motivate behavior changes. We want this person to behave, to change the behavior, yeah? Seek a behavior that is uh, desirable to him and even to the people who he's living with. Uh, change his lifestyle for the better, for him to be appreciated and for him to be accepted back in the community. Thank you. The goals and treatment, we want to initiate and maintain a prolonged substance because as I said of drugs, as I said, uh, when people start taking drugs, they go to dependence or addiction. Yeah? It is very hard for somebody to come back. As I said, the, it is a disease that, uh, that, that can be managed, but the people do not live out of it. We always say that once addicted, you can always get addicted again. Once you are in substance abuse, you can still go back, no, no matter the time. You can see, you, somebody can still get them. So they just need a trigger. And a trigger can be a family, a trigger can be a workplace, a trigger can be, you know, as, you know, as something stressful, an, an event that can take them back. So our goal is to initiate and maintain a prolonged abstinence from drugs. That is the goal of treatment and rehabilitation. We want to identify and develop a healthier means to cope with the stress. The stressors will be there, even for us who are not addicted, even for anybody who is not addicted. The stressors are there. we still uh, come up, you know, come across stressors in our lives. Yeah, but for us who are not addicted, we are able to to cope with. We are able to deal with the stressors because we have the. We, we, we have the we have the power but for them who are who have been addiction and uh, dependent the, the power is limited and that is why we want to identify and develop healthier means of coping with the stressors and also identify the the triggers they have to identify what can trigger them to go back to substance use for them to relapse they have to identify when i pass this, through this route I usually uh, find my, you know, Mangueni. They usually call it Mangueni or the Madeni. The den is the, 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 the den where they usually drink. So what happens? Let me use this other route because it is wrong route, but it is better I use this wrong route instead of using where I'll go and meet my former, you know, friends who I was drinking with. Uh, we also want them to acquire or develop a health productive lifestyle. We want them to go back and become healthy. We want them to be productive citizens in the society, in the community, at home. And then we also want to be, they, they want to be reintegrated into normal family life. They want to go, if it was a husband. I usually, they usually say that when I was in addiction, I never used to do anything. My wife used to take uh, over everything. She used to be the husband, she used to be the wife, she used to be the head and she used to be the name. Now he has gone back to the family. For him to be reintegrated, he has got to sit down with the family, with the wife, and let her understand that this guy is back and he needs his heart back. He needs his head back. So how do you reintegrate them? If there's a lot that is being done, that is our goal, to make sure that this person is reintegrated back to the family and taking his position. Because the position has got to be there. If he's the father, he's the head of that family, he has got to take that position. So we have to work 
with them for them to understand how far they have come and also understand that they must have had so many people during their addition during their dependence in the, in the, in the drug so they have to go slowly so that they can be accepted by the family in conclusion I hope I've, I've not taken a lot of time, my time is there. In conclusion, chemical dependence or addiction treatment is often a long-term process and may require multiple episodes of treatment. You can, I have seen people saying that to me, rehab maraya kwanza ya pili, ya tatu sasa tumechoka, hata, he will never get cured. People have got to understand, this is a long-term process which may require multiple, multiple, multiple episodes of treatment. It is not a one-off thing. It is not a one-time thing. It is something that can be repeated often and often until this person gets the help that he needs. It might not even work because as I say, somebody can take 10 years, but it still go back to uh, dependence and substance use. So it is not, you cannot say that because he has gone to the rehab once, we will not go to the rehab again. Uh, now he is cured. And when you fight them, him drunk tomorrow, you think that now this is, he wants to do it. It's not that they want to do it. It is what the, the drug did to his body or to his brain that is making him or her be where, go back and maybe experience. And the triggers I talked about and the stressors that I talked about, these are things that can make somebody go back. So chemical dependence addiction or addiction treatment is often a long term, a long term, uh, a long term thing that cannot just be wished off. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much again. Uh, thank you, Medita Catherine. I have learned a lot. Uh, you have demystified a lot of the areas that we only get to hear of and uh, know nothing about what happens, um, what what they what they are about. Areas such as the downward spiral of psychological addiction, uh, types of dependency, manifestation, and you know characteristics of addiction. Um, for those who may not know, I'd just like to give a big big uh, bit of background on. Uh, who our facilitator has been. Uh, mediator Catherine, she's a certified uh, professional mediator. Uh, she's an addiction professional who has worked with NACADA. She's a member of ISAP. Uh, she's also a counseling psychologist and a, a counseling supervisor as well. And uh, she's also a member of the Kenya Counseling and Psychologist Association. So clearly we have, uh, we are privileged to have you and to benefit from the wealth of information that you have given us um, today. Uh, before we proceed to our five minute health break, I'd like to invite our convener, Mijita Wangari, to just say a few things before we proceed to our health break. Uh, Emelda, maybe before Wagari comes in, can I just uh, add some things more? No, no, no problem. Proceed. No problem. Eh? Yeah, there's something that I feel it is important for people to understand. Uh, when you talk about addiction, we deal with the two major parts. I said it is a brain disease. It is important to know which part of the brain that really makes, you know, who I am and which part of the brain is really affected by this substance that I'm talking about. Uh, in our brain, we have two major parts of the brain. That's the frontal cortex. I know it might be so scientific and so medical, but it is important for us to know. There are two types of brains. There's the frontal cortex and there's the midbrain. The frontal cortex is this part of the brain, and then the midbrain is the, the part of the brain that is we call the brain. The frontal cortex is the part of the brain that makes us, us. It makes me who I am. That is the frontal, the frontal cortex. It makes you who you are. That is the frontal cortex, yeah? Uh, uh, this makes who you are, that is your personality, what you value, your values, your power, your sense of choice, that is the frontal cortex. And also it is a, a usually, you know, a sense of choice, uh, what you think, uh, 
And I usually like saying that it is the Superman. The frontal cortex is the first Superman in us because it is who I am. It is who you are. It is who every person is. It is who we are. And then we have the midbrain. Yeah? The midbrain is our survival brain that keeps us alive. The, the function of our midbrain is just survival. It is just geared to our survival. So what does that mean? You can't fix it or change it. Actually, you cannot fix the midbrain or change it. Eh? Or it's, it, it, or you tell it what to do. That is the midbrain. You cannot tell it what to do. Yeah? Its role is to keep us alive and functions, the functions of the midbrain. It is known as survival brain because it helps us to eat when we want to eat. Even when a child is born, the midbrain is the one that makes you know the child uh, start looking for food. Yeah? That, that 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 center. Yeah? And then it, it is actually it kills. It is the one that helps us to identify to identify the predator and kill because we want to be safe. That is the midbrain, and then the sex. It helps us. It's from the midbrain that we're able to procreate. Yeah, that is the center that makes you know uh, people have those organs, organisms of organisms of uh, procreation. Yeah, so it is important for us to understand because I said addiction is a brain disease. Thank you. Karibu uh, sana, Medita Ongai. Uh, Santi Sana, thank you very much uh, uh, our, to our session host, um, um, mediator Emerald Midaga, who's a mediator in practice. And uh, I also wish to thank uh, uh, our mediator Catherine Waroe, who's uh, been our masterclass facilitator today on a topic that uh, is extremely relevant. And uh, we do find that it's probably not an area that we focus on or we have put a lot of uh, interest in, even as uh, colleagues uh, who are practicing. But uh, the conversation we are having now is to lead us to the next part in terms of, so how does this interrelate or influence or affect mediation? So my name is Wangare Kabiru and I convene the Wasiliana Hub community, which is a great place to be if you're a, a mediator in Kenya and also growing community across Africa uh, and with networks. And uh, what we do is that we provide an opportunity for mediation practice to grow, to thrive, uh, with our focus on three areas, positioning, policy and practice. And as a result of that, that is why you find that we have conversations like this, some that speak into mediation directly, some that seem to speak into the multidisciplinary areas, and also others that are not necessarily related, but yes, we know that they are important. So as uh, peers and colleagues, I once again, thank you for joining us on this call. I also acknowledge our the um, American Spaces, who's our partner in, uh, in, in ensuring that the mediation uh, awareness and knowledge in Kenya continues to thrive and grow. Um, and uh, yeah, we are delighted that uh, they are uh, supporting us in um, enabling the publics get to know about uh, the conversations around uh, mediation. So just to highlight to colleagues that the master classes are actually being run with peer mediators. And so we invite you if you are a mediator and you have an area of expertise, please let us know, please reply to the email that you received when you are joining into this conversation. Let us know your area of expertise and we'll be delighted to work with you so that you can enlighten us on that area as uh, we build the connection with uh, uh, mediation practice. So once again, I thank you uh, Emma, uh, to our facilitator um, and host today, uh, Mediator Emerald Midega, and also to our speaker, our facilitator for the masterclass today, Catherine Marui, and we look forward to also the next sessions that uh, we will be having. So Karibu Nisana and uh, Emerald, we may take the, you may let us know um, about the break and what time we come back. Thank you, Asante. Thank you so much, Mediator Wangari. Uh, at this juncture, we have now reached the point where we go for our health break. We will break for a five minute break um, uh, until it is now 3.25. We will proceed, we'll come back at 3.30. And then at that point, we will go to our next, the next phase of our session where we'll be looking at how these, all the information that you've garnered today, how this plays into mediation in terms of the relevant skills that are needed and are that are needed to be acquired to be able to facilitate a mediation process where addiction is involved. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let us proceed to our health break.
<laughs> okay, so we are now back from the from the health break. Uh, just as a, a brief reminder, uh, this is part of uh, our monthly series, the April monthly, monthly series, <clears throat> which is uh, for Wasiliana Hub Masterclasses, which is a uh, part of the conflict transformation and the CLEE classes uh, for 2021. And the next one of uh, this uh, today was the first session for the April uh, series. The first, the next session will be held on the 22nd of uh, April, which is next Thursday. And uh, the topic will be on abuse. And the facilitator will be uh, mediator Patricia, Patricia Oketch. So just as a point of information, kindly schedule to attend. Um, we would now, we are now proceeding to the, to the next uh, phase of the, um, of the session. And at this point, we will be having a brief case study. We will share the screen with you and just go through a brief case study. And then this will usher us in into the next uh, phase. I will read it out as you go along with me. In this situation, we in this scenario, we have Mr. X is an employee in an, in an organization where he has been working as a truck driver for 15 years. Recently, the supervisor has noticed that Mr. X has been reporting late to work and often sneaks, from work, sneaks off from work before the, his shift is over. He has become very argumentative. One week ago, he caused an accident that cost the organization millions of shillings in compensation. He was sus subsequently suspended pending, uh, pending final dismissal. He later approached uh, the union in which he's a member seeking representation uh, to have him reinstated to his position. As a certified mediator, you are invited to mediate between Mr. X and uh, the organization. Mediator Catherine, back to you. Um, could you please highlight to us what, what is happening here? What are some of the salient issues that are coming up? And uh, what are the skills that you believe are valuable or uh, relevant as a mediator? You know, as a mediator, what are the things that you're looking out for? What are the salient issues that are, are, are being brought out by this uh, case scenario? And what would you look out for in a situation where you're, you've been called upon to handle a dispute like that? Uh, <coughs> According to the history, or according to the story that uh, you just read, uh, this person has worked in that organization for many years. Uh, and according to the, the story, it's as if he has been working well until, you know, maybe uh, recently, as he has said, as the, the story says, that he has been reporting on duty late and being an entity. Uh, one thing that uh, makes somebody not get motivated to work, it might be maybe he's in substance use or maybe he's demotivated. Yeah, it might be maybe to the, because of the money, the managerial aspect or maybe personal issues, which as a mediator will be able to look into and see why this person is, you know, has started the behavior. As I talked about uh, addiction as a behavior, there's a behavioral context. There's a behavior that the supervisor has noted and the behavior is coming late and also being argumentative. It is, those are uh, attributes or qualities that he had, he, didn't, he never had, because uh, the story says it is just, you know, recently. Uh, also ha make, uh, having an accident, causing an accident, that can be normal accidents happen even to people who are not addicts. So as a, as a mediator, we would like to really understand that or maybe facilitate this session and understand you know, in, which, in, uh, in this case scenario, what happened for, the, for there to be an accident? Was it because of uh, you know, his behavior? Or maybe it was a mechanical problem because maybe the, the, the machine had a mecha mechanical, the truck made, maybe had a mechanical problem. Uh, however, it is important that uh, he has uh, he, he has sick, he has gone to seek for a redress by the way of uh, the, the union coming in. And maybe he found he cannot, he, he cannot be able to face the organization all by himself. So the skills that will be used there, there as a 
or as a mediator for you to be able to facilitate the understanding of the scenario, they are this person to uh, they are to have an understanding, and and also the organization because you really want them to come together and be able to talk. Thank you. Okay, um, okay. colleagues uh, on the call. If you have any comments, kindly put them on the chat regarding uh, um, this. Regarding the screen that has been shared, regarding the case preview, what do you think is happening? Um, what are some of the issues that you think are being raised in this situation? And uh, for Medita Kath, uh, Catherine, as we mentioned be, uh, before, what we're dealing with in this uh, section, we are trying to focus on the on the conflict and the tactics and the skills needed in uh, in relation to to mediation. And so, assuming this has uh, landed on your desk, uh, I imagine a situation where I don't have any I don't have any background. All the background that I have is basically basically what I have learned today um, on this call. Uh, what are some of those areas, such as manifest manifestation? Right. In your presentation, I noticed that uh, you are talking about manifestation and characteristics characteristics of addiction. What are some of the ways that it manifests so that I can identify rather that this is uh, addiction? And uh, also, um, when it comes to uh, addiction, we have heard that there are people who are considered functional, um, functional uh, addic addicts. So in, in that sense, what what level of uh, what what approach do you take in uh, establishing someone's competence uh, uh, in terms of participating in that mediation? When we look at uh, manifestation and we look at the behavioral attitude or how they're behaving, how do we identify their level of con competence? Sorry, we cannot hear you. Kindly admit yourself. Uh, as I was saying, uh, dependence or addiction is a complex issue. I say that it is also a brain disease, and um, because it affects the brain, and when it affects the brain, it affects even our way of thinking. It affects even our way of listening, and uh, it can even affect our way of uh, making judgment. Yeah. So as you enter or, or as you engage in mediation with this particular uh, person and uh, maybe the organization, you, 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 you ask the mediator because ours is to facilitate it. You will, uh, as you engage them in talking, you will be able to notice the, in the coherence of, of the information that they are giving. Yeah. You'll be able to, to, to notice, you'll be able to capture, is this person coherent? Is this person, whatever they are saying, is it making sense? Yeah, because uh, as much as you are not an addiction professional, anything that is making sense, it is possible for anybody to understand or to identify this, is, this person is making sense. Uh, the way they behave, yeah? Somebody can be there, but not even listen, listening to what you are talking about. Maybe he's dosing off if he's in that extreme use of the drug. Maybe he's dosing off. Maybe he's even yawning. Maybe you know you could you can see even the symptoms, the, the signs right now, the eyes. He's trying very hard to close to open the eyes, but he cannot. Maybe he's trying to, to talk, but he cannot even finish a sentence. That is a case that we can we can say it is to the extreme. And so you as a mediator, in such a case, uh, I really don't see any business that you can facilitate because we know ours is to facilitate. If you, if this person is not making sense, this person is not even listening. This person is not even, you know, have have way he's asleep. Will you come? Will you have an agreement? I really don't think so. So as a, as, as as a mediator, you have you 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 have the choice. You, you have the powers 
to say that this person, as much as uh, I have been called upon for to mediate, I don't think he can be in a position to make a you know uh, in a we, we call it what you know a right decision, an informed choice, because he's at the moment he's intoxicated. The second one, he's not able to in uh, in coherently uh, air his views. Or maybe he's not even listening. He's absent-minded. So those are some of the things that you can you, you can look at, you, you can look up to when you are doing a mediation in such a case. However, the others we call them a functioning, a functioning, you know, a functioning alcoholic, a functioning somebody who is able to function even after taking whatever they have been taking. Such a person also, it is possible you understand. Are they really making sense? Yeah, are we what we are talking? Are they really grasping? Is it really making you know sense? Is it sensible? Is he really concentrating? Because if he's functioning at all, it means that he works and he knows about his surrounding. He knows what is going on, what is all about. For somebody who is not able to function normally, maybe he wake up and say, "Why am I here? Who brought me here?" You understand? So in such a case scenario what will you facilitate? But for somebody who is functioning, it is somebody who is able to work, to work is somebody who is able to make a light decision, informed decision, regardless of maybe what they have been taking. So you have, you, you have the power as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a mediator to say up to here, I did not think that this, unfortunately this mediation cannot take place because of one, two, three, you can say it, yeah? because you have the powers as a mediator. Because you make a wrong decision, it will be the mediator who has made the, you know, you never facilitated well. So your knowledge, your observation, yeah. Uh, I also say there is also the, the, the what, the cue that you have. Are we, is this person really okay? So for us to continue. So that is what I can say. Yeah, you make your decision depending on that specific time and the scenario that you are in. If it is not somebody who can make a decision, just like they usually say, if you are here and you cannot uh, appear the signature when you come to, a, to, a, to, a, to, a, to an agreement, then you cannot uh, continue having it. This person is not okay. How can he, he'll go back to the court and say that I was so drunk, I was under the influence. So even this meditation that uh, even this thing that you are saying I signed, I think I never signed. This I don't think this is my signature. So you you have you 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 have the you you have the mandate. You have the power to say that uh, until such a time that this person is able to make an informed decision, that is when we can we um, we can we can we can say we come for meditation. Otherwise, that is somebody maybe who needs treatment and rehabilitation. Thank you again, uh, Medita Catherine. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you have any comments or questions, kindly uh, use the raise your hand function, or you could also type in your question and comments at uh, in the chat. Ah, okay. Kindly unmute yourself, Ellen. Karibu, karibu sana, Helen. Proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes, we can proceed. Oh, thank you. I apologize that I came in late, but I am very passionate about the topic that is going on this afternoon. And I just want to underscore what our speaker has said. She, she put it straight that we, we cannot proceed with any mediation um, if we find uh, someone has been under the influence of uh, drugs or substances. I think our, our speaker wanted to say that one of the Earlier things, the first thing we want to do when we get into the court or when we get into mediation 
is even as we welcome the parties, behind our mind, we are observing, we are making, uh, let me say psychological assessment so that we are able to say, this mediation will proceed or will not proceed. And I really think that's our, our starting point as psychologists in, in mediation, because we want to ensure that our parties have sound mental health and we can do a quick mental status evaluation just by you know, having the parties arrive and sit down. So we observe them, we, we listen, and we, before we go too far, we can be able to tell what direction this mediation will take. So I really appreciate uh, our speaker, Catherine, is that her name? Catherine, I really appreciate um, and underscore the need for assessment. And I think even as we, we go, even in normal mediation, I think we have a, a clinical touch as we deal with the cases. Because most of the times, even the people under the, uh, who are going through uh, substance abuse, or who are addicts, underneath that addiction are, are salient issues that got them to that position. So as um, mediator psychologists, we can be able to add value to this work. And I believe mediation is, is, is the way to go with things. So as we carry on mediation, underneath, we are looking at the clinical issues of concern that have brought people this far. And she went on to say that um, it's a long-term treatment. I agree. So our first is to make an assessment to go on or to recommend um, a psychological review or to, to even suggest a psychiatric um, review because we can't go on uh, with mediation with people who have issues with mental health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you so much for your comments and for your valuable addition. Any other person with a comment? We can see a question on the chat. Uh, as a mediator, has any of you ever experienced a situation like this? Has any of you ever come across a situation where you have to um, address issues of addiction in terms of a mediation that is before you? And what was yes. your experience? Yes, Helen, proceed. What was your experience? Thank you. Right now, I am dealing with uh, a case of a father and a son. And the father got so fed up because the son has been into one rehabilitation center after the other. So finally, the judiciary asked uh, me to go and, and take a look at that case. And when I went, I went into caucus with each one of them. And unfortunately, I could not proceed with that mediation because after doing the mental status evaluation, I saw that um, the client, the, the defendant needed to go for 
um, psychological treatment before they can proceed uh, with mediation. And I made that recommendation. And these cases can be very common as, and, and they come under criminal offense or something like that. But when you look closely, you will find that they have had um, clinical issues that were not addressed. And therefore, the, the case takes long in the court, the file comes up again and again. And the reasonable thing to do is the mediator, the psychologist, to make that um, assessment and make a recommendation. Thank you. Thank you so maybe, much. Thank you for your experience. Maybe I can comment a little on having had um, a mediation with somebody who was uh, one, one, one party was actually came in drunk and um, uh, we, we had to terminate until later. But again, like Helen says, uh, we, we, I had to refer. But one way uh, that we can also deal with uh, the case study is that in caucus, you can get a lot of details from the parties. So in the caucus, you would be able to talk to the driver, find out how his life has been, because no, nobody, nobody gives us a chart to follow on how we are going to ask the questions. So you can in that area of caucus find out how he has been living, what has happened, how come all of a sudden this is happening to his life. And from that caucus, you know, um, we should be able to gauge his mental status and be able to say, Apana, this one has to be referred back. So there is, um, th th there is need to, to caucus during that time so that you get as much detail as you can from these parties and to find out why, what happened at the accident, you know? Uh, let, let them have as much confidence in, in you as possible. How did this happen? How come this is the complaint that is coming up recently? It has never happened before. How is your family? What is happening to you? And in that way, collect all the information that one would, uh, would need for, uh, for a decision to be made. But thank you so much, uh, Catherine. Thank, thank you, thank you very, very much. Very enlightening. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Medita Patricia. Um, Medita Patricia, uh, this month we know we, we know that this month we are focusing on uh, expertise areas, and actually, just as a point of information, Medita Medita Patricia Oketch is actually the one that will be facilitating um, next week's uh, masterclass on abuse which is of course something very interesting to look out for. Uh, we are now drawing to a close uh, for the meeting. It was an interesting perspective to hear the, the element of introducing caucus and how we can use caucus to try and bring out those issues that ordinarily would not be so uh, uh, obvious to the naked eye or right off the bat. So mm -hmm. that is also an interesting perspective. We are now drawing to the, clo to the close of the meeting. And um, as you can see on the screen that is there before you, uh, this is a, it is a series for the month of April and we'll have two sessions. We have just come to the close of the first session. The next one will be next week on Thursday, uh, same time, two to four on the 22nd. And uh, we'll be uh, tackling the topic of abuse, which is another uh, grand topic. <clears throat> and, uh, the idea is to also look at uh, 
conflict as it relates, abuse as it relates to to, conf, to conflict and uh, conflict transformation and, and, and how us as mediators can become efficient in terms of dealing with um, uh, mediation disputes, mediation issues such as this one. So at this point, I would like to acknowledge and uh, give thanks to everyone who, all the ladies and gentlemen for joining us and uh, for participating. Thank you again. Thank you again for sharing your experiences and uh, your, your knowledge. A big thank you to our facilitator, mediator Catherine, for the wealth of knowledge that you have imparted upon us. Uh, I believe that you have, give, you have given us a stepping stone, something to look at, uh, something, to, something to think about, uh, and it has been very interesting. And finally, a big thank you to uh, Wasiliana Hub and the great initiative it is taking towards uh, conflict transformation. Again, uh, I would just like to reiterate that uh, next week we'll be having the session on abuse <clears throat> on Thursday. So please look out for that. We are now drawing to a close of the sessions and uh, would like to end with the national anthem. I will share it again. I will guide you through it and then We can come to the end. So we'll proceed with the national anthem in English, the first stanza. O oh God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace and liberty, plenty be found within our borders. Thank you again. Thank you again, colleagues, for joining us. They're very grateful. And with that, we have come to the end of the session. Thank you.